Salutations all. Welcome to this very important webinar, The Cuban Economy Today, Cuba Confronts the US Blockade, COVID-19 Pandemic, and New Economic Challenges and Policies. Before I proceed uh, to introduce myself and to introduce my fellow co-chair, I think it's important that we acknowledge that those of, in, those of us in North America are situated on land that was dispossessed, that was colonized from indigenous peoples. I am speaking from Halifax, Canada, uh, the unceded, unsurrendered territory of the Mi'kmaq Nation. My name is Isaac Saini. I am one of your co-chairs tonight. And my other co-chair is Azza Rojbi, who is a North African social justice and anti-racism activist, author of the book, US and Saudi War on the People of Yemen, uh, produced by the Battle of Ideas Press in 2019. She is coordinator of Friends of Cuba Against the US Blockade, as well as is a member of the editorial board of Fire This Time news of the Fire This Time newspaper, writing and researching on Middle Eastern and North African politics. Thank you, Isaac, and thank you everybody for joining us here today. I see some more folks are coming in. Um, I my name is Aza, as Isaac introduced me. I, I want to welcome all of you for this very important webinar. Um, and I want to introduce my co-chair, Isaac. Uh, Dr. Isaac Saini is a Cuba specialist at Dalhousie University, Halifax, Canada. He is the author of the book, Cuba, A Revolution in Motion, Z2004. Uh, he's also the author of various scholarly articles on Cuba and is currently finishing Africa's Children Return, Cuba, Africa, and Apartheid's End, Linksington Books. Uh, he is also the co-chair and national spokesperson for the Canadian Network on Cuba. Uh, before I hold, it, I um, pass the virtual microphone again uh, to my co-chair Isaac. Uh, I wanted to let everybody know that today's webinar is being uh, simultaneously translated into Spanish. Uh, if you are listening to me in the English, and if you'd like to listen in English, there's nothing you need to do. You are in the right room. You do not need to change anything with the interpretation setting. Uh, but I'm actually switching to Spanish to let folks know that are listening in to Spanish how to turn on uh, the interpretation setting. Uh, hola a todos y todas. Uh, gracias por estar con nosotros hoy en este muy importante webinar hablando de la economía de Cuba y uh, gracias para estar con nosotros. Uh, para activar la interpretación en bus computadoras, uh, buscan el icono con forma de globo uh, al hacer clic, se despliega un menú. Selecciona allí su idioma español, por supuesto. Uh, en celulares o en tablets, uh, busquen la opción interpretación de idioma en el menú y seleccione su idioma. Dan en clic y debes clicar en listo. Esto último es muy importante, si no, la interpretación no va a estar activa. En todos los dispositivos uh, tienen la opción de silenciar el audio original para solo escuchar en español. Uh, thank you, everybody. I'm going to pass the virtual microphone again uh, to my co-chair, Isaac Saini. <clears throat> Once again, greetings to all. Saludos a todos y todos uh, to this very important and what we think will be very informative webinar on the Cuban economy. The COVID-19 pandemic has starkly exposed but dr and dramatically amplified social fissures, inequalities, and inequities, especially in the sphere of healthcare and social security. In this regard, Cuba stood out for its ability to achieve levels of social development, perhaps unparalleled in the global South and even in the rest of the world. In Cuba, everyone is guaranteed an education and access to universal and free healthcare. In Cuba, there are no homeless roaming the streets. No one is left to fend for themselves, eking out an existence in a dog eat dog society. Cuba is not a haven for the economic violence that reigns in so many countries. The annual United Nations Human Development Report att reports attest to the success in this regard of the Cuban Revolution. These annual reports are recognized by many as the most comprehensive and extensive determination of the well being of the world's peoples. Since its inception, the Human Development Reports have repeatedly confirmed the advances and progress of the Cuban Revolution. Cuba is firmly placed in the category of high human development. Moreover, moreover, Cuba ranks first in terms of the relationship between economic means and the capacity for human development. In other words, Cuba's ranking in the Human Development Report outstrips its per capita world ranking. 
Thus, in the effective use of resources for human benefit, Cuba outperforms the much richer countries of the so-called developed world. In short, Cuba is a country that effectively uses its very modest resources for the benefit of its citizens. Today's webinar focuses on how these resources are created, generated, and distributed. We will examine the Cuban economy. The immediate context is the island nation's unification of currencies into one single currency that recently happened on January 1st, uh, was initiated on January 1st of this year, 2021. We also, in immediate context, will consider the recent significant expansion of non-state non sector, that is self-employment and private economic activity. There's also the impact of the pandemic, and of course, the ongoing impact of the more than 230 specific sanctions imposed against Cuba by the previous Trump regime. It bears noting that the US economic embargo, the blockade, has never been more zealously and viciously persecuted than it was under Donald Trump. The broader context is the more than decade long series of economic measures adopted by Cuba to update the Cuban economic model. For many who study Cuba from disinterested parties, in many cases academics, to strident opponents of Cuba, to supporters of the Cuban revolution, quick key questions arise that I'm sure our esteemed panelists will address in one way or the other. How has the historic commitment of the Cuban revolution to the goal of equality been affected by these new economic policies? How much does this Havana labeled updating of the economic model embody in continuity of fundamental departure from the previous practice of the Cuban revolution. How will these measures contribute and lead to, as Raul Castro rep repeatedly underscored, a sustainable and prosperous socialism? It bears noting that for any country to try and cope and overcome the current worldwide economic crisis in a manner that favors its people, not the global monopolies, is no small feat. This is all the more true for a country such as Cuba that is subjected to a brutal all-sided economic war from the United States. One cannot forget that Cuba's impressive achievements in human development have occurred in the face of all-sided aggression by Washington. Washington has never accepted the January 1st, 1959 verdict of the Cuban people. As a historian and a Cuba specialist, it is hard for me not to conclude that Washington's objective is the negation and extinguishing of Cuba's right to self-determination and independence. Washington's economic sanctions, this economic war against Cuba has cost Cuba in the excess of 1 trillion US dollars. This is why many Cuban specialists and observers of Cuba assert that the US economic blockade is perhaps the principal obstacle to Cuba's economic development. The mainstream media and various periodicals are awash with articles that claim that Havana has embarked on a very risky course with monetary unification and the expansion of private economic activity. The announcement of the new Cuban economic measures did not come as a surprise to any serious journalist or observer of Cuba. Various nationwide consultation and debates, a frequent practice in Cuba, have been initiated over the last decade and in fact over the course of the Cuban revolution, specifically on strategic issues such as what economic direction to take. The planned restructuring of the state sector has been discussed by all trade unions and mass organizations in the newspapers, on radio and television. Workers have themselves played a meaningful role, an extensive role, in deciding measures that are necessary to strengthen Cuba's economy, upon which they depend for the living, and how these measures will be implemented. When critical decisions have to be made regarding the direction of Cuban society, the country is transformed into, into a vast island-wide parliament. For example, as just one example, in 2010, 2011, a mass discussion was held on those lineamentos, the guidelines, the proposals to renew and update the Cuban economic model. From December 2010 to February 2011, over 163,000 meetings involving almost 9 million people were held to discuss the various proposals and guidelines. As a result of this mass national discussion and debate across the island and in Cuba's national, provincial, and municipal assemblies, more than two thirds of the original 299 proposals were modified. Eventually, a total of 311 guidelines emerged. These 311 guidelines were further debated and discussed at the sixth Congress of the Communist Party of Cuba, in which 86 guidelines, 28% of the 311 were amended, with two new ones adopted, resulting in 313 guidelines. However, this has not been the end of the national debate and discussion. Uh, these, the three documents that outline Cuba's future path, those lineamientos, la conceptualización del modelo económico y social cubano de desarrollo socialista, and Plan 2030, okay, are the product of this profound mass engagement with Cuban citizens. 
These documents were submitted to another nationwide scrutiny and analysis by Cubans in 2016, and this mass scrutiny continues. The recent changes, the monetary and unification and expansion of private economic activity are, not, are new, but they are not risky in the sense that Cubans are not gamblers. They closed down the mafia run casinos more than 60 years ago and ended that regime, which permitted the impoverishment of the majority of the people and the corruption of all of Cuban life. If, if the measures which defend this are a risk, we can confidently say that for more than 60 years, the Cubans have shown themselves capable of meeting the challenge they take up. Thank you. And now we are open to hear the brilliant and I think will be very insightful uh, presentations of our panelists. Thank you very much, Isaac. And uh, again, uh, I think to finish with your words, um, Isaac, I, I also want to echo what you were saying about uh, Cuba for over 60 years, not only stood against the blockade, not only um, brought creative ways to go forward against the blockade, but Cuba thrived. Uh, and what could Cuba do if the blockade is lifted? I think it's shown to us, especially today in this time of pandemic, uh, where Cuba have sent doctors all over the world helping other countries uh, fighting against the COVID-19 pandemic. Uh, we see how Cuba is dealing with this pandemic and we see how the United States is. Uh, and we know that Cuba is an example for humanity in standing up for justice, in standing up. Um, and that's, that's why it inspires a lot of us um, from Canada, from the United States and around the world to stand up with Cuba and, and stand up against the United States and just and cruel blockade against Cuba. And, and I'm very um, honored today to be um, here with all of you along with this uh, very um, amazing panels of speakers and experts in their field that we have for you tonight, uh, speaking about the economy of Cuba and the new changes of Cuba and the ways that Cuba still fights against the blockade and fights to go forward and fights to go uh, and thrive in the midst of all this aggression and all this attack. And um, for some of you that are joining us uh, today and, and might not know about the work of the U.S. Cuba Normalization uh, Conference Committee, uh, who's your host tonight, who's putting together this webinar and has been uh, creating a series of webinars for the last few months um, under this harsh reality of the pandemic uh, in the bringing together Cuba solidarity activists from across the United States, Canada, and around the world. And so uh, the, the U.S. Cuba Normalization Conference Committee um, is a coalition of groups, individuals uh, that came together to organize the second conference on U.S. Cuba normalization uh, to be held at Fordham University in New York in March 2020. Due to the global COVID-19 pandemic, uh, that conference had to be postponed. Uh, but the momentum and the coalitions that wanted to build that conference decided to continue uh, coming together to continue their collaboration uh, and continue working towards ending the unjust United States blockade on Cuba. And also building a campaign which is called the Saving Lives Campaign. Uh, it's a very, very important campaign between the United States and Canada and Cuba uh, that aims to promote US-Cuba and Cuba-Canada medical collaboration uh, in confronting this global pandemic. Uh, the U.S.-Cuba Normalization Conference Committee uh, is continuing to work together along with the National Network on Cuba, the Canadian Network on Cuba, and La Table de Concertation de Solidarité Québec-Cuba to build webinars like this one uh, you're attending today and other events and action in solidarity with Cuba. I wanted to also to share with some of you, if, if you haven't came across uh, the Saving Lives campaign, a very important piece of our work. Um, I wanted to share with you what we call for in this campaign and, and the three main demands of this campaign. And all of, all of this will be, links to all of this will be posted in the chat too, so you can share it with other folks. The Saving Lives campaign uh, specifically calls for, one, allowing US, Cuba, Canada, medical, clinical, and scientific collaboration, including inviting Cuban medical brigades to provide direct medical assistance and or to provide advice and guidance in treating COVID-19. Two, incorporating Cuba's interferon alpha-2b recombinant in clinical trials in the United States, Canada, and the World Health Organization and the granting by the US Food and Drug Administration approval for Cuba's interferon alpha-2b recombinant. 
three, ending U.S. economic and travel sanctions against Cuba, including its extraterritorial nature and the attempts to stop all other countries accepting Cuban medical brigades and assistance and all ongoing measures that prevent Cuba accessing and importing medical equipment and medicine to confront COVID-19. The momentum that the US-Cuba normalization has been able to uh, build uh, can be seen and can be felt in the United States and Canada. And I think one example I wanted to share, uh, which is uh, the passing in Chicago City Council of a very important resolution uh, asking for the end of the United States blockade on Cuba. This resolution in Chicago, one of the biggest cities in the United States, uh, comes along a lot of different events and other resolutions that have been passed throughout the United States and also here in Canada, coming together from the US in Canada to support each other against this unjust blockade. Um, before um, passing the virtual mic back to my co-chair Isaac to kick us off and, and start with our first speaker, uh, I wanted to uh, take a little bit of a time to thank all the people that made today possible, uh, all the folks that are in the US-Cuba Normalization Coalition. Uh, I know they're, they're bi-weekly meetings, I think, and, and they work uh, every, every day, every week to keep this momentum of this conference, to keep the momentum of coming together is really important. And, and today I specifically uh, want to uh, thank um, our friends from the interpretation team who will be providing uh, simultaneous Spanish uh, interpretation and that's Roberto Yis, Antonio Artuso, and Duan Stilwell. Thank you, and I hope I'm, I'm, I'm controlling myself to speak slower for you. Thank you for your effort. Thank you for being here and providing this uh, interpretation of this very, very important webinar. Uh, thank you also uh, to John Waller and Aaron uh, Naham, who both are uh, moderating the chat and the Q&A for today. Uh, you'll see Aaron will be posting a lot of the things that I'm announcing in the chat, so make sure you visit the chat. And uh, I also want to thank uh, Alison Boudin and Tamara Hansen, who are coordinating the technical aspect of today. Uh, back to you, Isaac. It's not a web. It's not a, a webinar or Zoom. If you forget to unmute yourself. Uh, thank you, Aza. And first of all, uh, I must uh, extend my apology to the interpreters. I intended to speak slowly, but I, I guess I spoke a little too fast. My apologies as well. Uh, all good intentions often get lost in the passion of the moment. Uh, we have a very rich panel here that I think will provide brilliant insight into what's unfolding in Cuba. And it's important that we have with us not only established academics like Helen Yaffe, uh, Dr. Tamara Lee, and Dr. Emily Morris, who have established stellar reputations in studying Cuba, but we have the voice of also expert, experts from Cuba themselves. So without any further ado, uh, I'd like to introduce Juan Miguel Gonzalez Pena, first secretary of the Mission of Cuba to the United Nations. Juan Miguel has a degree in economics from the University of Havana in 2003, and a master's in international economic relations from the Raul, Ra Raul Roa Garcia High Institute of International Relations of Cuba in 2006. Juan Miguel, you have the floor, sir. Thank you so much for the invitation tonight. And I, before I begin my intervention, I just precisely wanted to thank all the organizers for inviting uh, us today to participate in this very important seminar and giving us the, the, this huge opportunity to present some important ideas related with the, the topic that bring us together today. I would also like to, to send uh, the commitments and the efforts in order to ensure the, the success for sure of this uh, very important webinar. It is also uh, um, our honor, no, our privilege uh, to be able to share with such a distinguished panelists, uh, which have a very broad and, and outstanding intellectual uh, work and have a very clear commitment to the most and just and novel causes uh, in, in the world. Uh, the, for the, for the, what uh, convinced us today, uh, Cuba, as you uh, are very well aware, is going through a very uh, complex uh, economic situation derived from the intensification of the economic, commercial, and financial blockade of the United States uh, toward uh, Cuba, aggravated by a context derived from the global crisis originated by the COVID-19, its effects, and the measures that have been uh, taken in order to face the, the pandemic. In the last uh, four years, 
there, ha there has been a progressive and systematic increase in the, aggressive, in the aggressiveness of the US policy against uh, our people and also against all states that maintain or attempt to establish economic, commercial, and financial relations with, uh, with Cuba. Uh, the more than 240 uh, measures implemented uh, during uh, the last administration of Donald Trump, uh, with more than uh, 50 adopted just in the, in the last year, in 2020, illustrate precisely this outrage against the Cuban people and, and our government. Since the activation of the Title uh, III of the Hans Burton Act in May 2019, uh, from Janu uh, until January uh, 2021, 28 lawsuits have been filed in, in US courts. Uh, this extraterritorial measure uh, in violation of international law has affected uh, US and third companies that have done or, or do business uh, with Cuba. This uh, has also caused uh, significant damage to the Cuban economy of uh, the economy of our country due to uh, precisely the intimidating effect uh, that it has on international the, the international business community. Uh, between 2020 and the early 2021, the US State Department expanded also the list of restricted Cuban entities on several occasions. Uh, to the vote, the creation of the list of prohibited accommodations in Cuba was added, which include 422 hotels and rental houses. These measures, along with uh, others, such as the suspension of the charter flights uh, to the entire uh, country with the section of Havana, have severely restricted travel by Americans, uh, contradict the support of broad sector of US people for ending the blockade, have threatened also the Cuba's emerging private sector and have dissuaded some foreign partners from engaging or continuing to operate with Cuba's entities, uh, in, in, which are included in this uh, unilateral uh, list. The ban on sending remittances to Cuba for on third countries through Western Union, uh, plus the constant persecution of Cuban financial operations abroad and the impossibility of processing remittances through the companies, uh, uh, social FinCEMEX and American International Services, as well as the intimidation of companies that transport fuel uh, supplies to our country, are example of the tightening of the blockade during uh, uh, these last uh, periods. Uh, add to the regime of, of all these measures results uh, resulting from the blockade regulations are the dissuasive and very intimidating effects associated with the recent inclusion of Cuba on the list of a state sponsor of terrorism, uh, a very unilateral action lacking any moral and, and legal uh, justification. All these measures uh, have had a very uh, negative uh, impact uh, to the growth of our country and, and also to its main sources of income. Uh, furthermore, they have continued to be applied in the context of, of uh, our country confronting the COVID-19 uh, pandemic, which has therefore led to the uh, concentration of our uh, scarce resources in support of the uh, Cuba's efforts in order to guarantee the health and, and well-being of our population and also in order to try to advance and move uh, forward our economic uh, recovery. It is a, a, in, in this very broad and, and, and very complex uh, context that uh, very recently the, the Cuban Council of Ministers announced a uh, a group of measures which has the purpose of expanding and strengthening the self-employment in, in our country as part precisely of the uh, country's social economic developmental strategy, uh, uh, in, which is uh, one of the main goals uh, for, for our development in Cuba. One of the most affected sectors in the last year has been precisely the one of the self-employed workers mainly due, uh, and it is important to highlight that, uh, due to the decrease of in tourist arrivals, uh, which have also depressed many economic activities linked to this activity. In addition, there has been a, a lack uh, of, of supplies and it has not been possible to establish a, a stable wholesale market for this particular sector in, in, in Cuba in the, in the last year at the same time. 
this pandemic uh, also has brought a very uh, general contraction to the economic activity. And in the case of the self-employed workers, some of them have uh, decided, uh, in, uh, due to the impact of the pandemic, have decided to suspend the exercise of a group of their activities. It should be noted, for example, that last year, uh, around 250,000 uh, uh, workers requested suspension of their licenses or partial limitation of their work. In, uh, in that sense, uh, it is important to, to recognize that the self-employed uh, workers are an intrinsic part of our economic model. And it is part of also of the country's uh, economic and social strategy, and they are included in the country's economic and social uh, policy uh, guidelines. There are currently in Cuba uh, more than 600,000 uh, self-employed workers uh, in, in working in many different areas, around which 30% uh, of them are uh, young people in, in, in their age. During the, 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 the pandemic in the last year, there have been countless endless displays of solidarities uh, from many of these self-employed workers, which is uh, some kind of recall the call by, by our president Miguel Diaz Canal in order to think uh, as, as a country. Uh, these uh, new measures, uh, we, ca we can note that they have not been done uh, with a short-term objective. They are broad and they, are, and they represent deep transformations. Uh, they are part precisely of our strategy, our economic and social development plans in 2030. And they are also part of the conceptualization of the economic model. And this is a design that has, a, we can say, a medium and very long-term vision. Uh, because it is important to, to also to emphasize that besides of resisting, we need to continue developing, making transformation with more uh, an in-depth vision that help us to develop uh, in the in the future. Uh, they are uh, they are um, because uh, it is important also to add. Uh, we need to add the the the, the work and the contributions of self-employed uh, workers uh, as as a very important complement in our economy. They generate quality jobs. They provide uh, possibilities uh, for productive linkage with the non-state sector, and they also allow uh, Cuba in order to reduce imports, to promote exports, and also to take full advantage of the potential of, uh, of our country and our talent that has been uh, developed after so many years uh, by the Cuban uh, Revolution. Among the principles that has been approved uh, recently by the Council of Ministers for the Self-Employment, it is uh, important to highlight that the scope of the activity will be determined uh, on the basis of the work project presented by the, by the person uh, interested. So in that sense, a specific homo uh, homogeneous and limited scopes as might be uh, the, the way that they used to operate before, uh, it will be eliminated. And provided that the project does not include any contravention of the limit activities that has been announced, they may include all the necessary uh, services that uh, are by bidding, uh, all of which would allow the creation of, uh, for example, services package. In other words, uh, anything that um, is not prohibited may be uh, performed. In, in the first stage, in, in the upcoming uh, months, the Cuban uh, National Statistics uh, Office uh, classifier for economic activity will be used as a reference in order to, to, uh, to let clear which are the activities that are uh, limit. Only 134 of them are limit of more than 2,100 activities that are contained in this uh, national classifier of economic uh, activity. So uh, in that sense, uh, this is a complete reversal of the way that was operating before the self-employment in, in Cuba, when only uh, there was a, an approved list of 127 activities. And just to summarize this, uh, we have gone from 127 uh, permitted activities to only 124 which are prohibited. All others can be done and can be uh, 
undertaken by our self uh, employers. They uh, also, it's important just to uh, go and conclude my remarks. They will need to register in order to update their work with projects and expand uh, all of them if they wish to do so. And this process can be done in, 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 the, next, in the next months. It is important also to highlight uh, that uh, there will be a, a, a much less, a less a bureaucratic process in order to carry out uh, all this process. All will, will be done through what it is called a single window, uh, through which all the necessary tramitations and, and procedures in order to present uh, and, and, and approve a process can be done. And in, in that sense, also the tax system, uh, it is important to highlight, uh, will be also part of the overall improvement that will be come uh, with the new, the new measure. The, precisely in this regard, the improvement of the tax system uh, will not lead to an increase, increase in the tax burden that uh, pay the self-employed uh, um, uh, persons uh, in Cuba. Uh, and it is important to, to add that uh, those uh, that the filing of the tax return at the end of the of the year will continue although only those who are taxed through the general regime in, in Cuba will pay the tax at, at that time of, of, of the year. Uh, just uh, just to conclude because I, I, it's important also other colleagues to to have uh, their views and to contribute to, to our discussions, uh, today, uh, I would like to to say two points. One is that uh, it is important to know that not all conditions are yet in place uh, from the point of view of supplies and raw materials and raw materials. And most of the reason for this it is also related with the with the impact of the blockade. Our economy, our economy is not renouncing to have a stable supply in of the wholesale markets for in this case for, for self employers, uh, that it is an objective that we are planning to, to achieve. And, and finally, uh, it is important uh, to know that uh, our government has informed that all the necessary uh, legal regulations in order to enforce and to, and to put in place the, 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 the new measures related with the self-employment in Cuba will be implemented in, in in the course of this uh, of this month so by the end of february it is expected uh, uh, that uh, most of this regulation will be ready or at the beginning of march at the latest according to the to the news that have come uh, officially from from cuba in in this regard i just would like to conclude my my intervention on this uh, very first part and this, in, in that sense, allowed uh, also other colleagues to present their views and, and opinions. And I will be happy to, to share with you later uh, along the, the course of the webinar and answer any possible question that might be raised by, by the, the distinguished participants here. I wanted to thank you uh, all for listening uh, to, to us. And I will be uh, happy to, to engage later on this. Thank you so much. Thank you so much to our speaker, uh, Juan Miguel Gonzalez. Uh, thank you for your comprehensive uh, bringing things together from the uh, most recent updates on, on Cuba's economical change. And uh, to hear more uh, from a Cuban perspective, uh, our next speaker um, is Alejandro Martinez Gonzalez. Uh, Alejandro is the third secretary of the Cuban Mission to the United Nations. Alejandro has a degree in economics from the University of Havana, 2013, and a master in international political relations from the Higher Institute of International Relations, 2016. Welcome, Alejandro. Thanks so much, Asad. I hope you, everyone, hear me well. First of all, I would like to express my gratitude to the organizers of this event for giving us the opportunity to convey our perspective of the economic data process in Cuba, and in turn, sharing this space with such outstanding scholars on the, on the subject. One of the most uh, debated issues in the current economic situation in Cuba is the process of monetary and exchange unification. 
I'm added not a sense of complexities, of course, but still of great need and urgency. To understand the process, uh, I think we shall make a brief review uh, illustrating how two currencies came to be in circulations with different exchange rates. This has its origins in the 90s with the economic crisis triggered by the dissolution of the Soviet Union, which caused an 85% drop in the Cuban foreign trade, and of course, a huge gaps in productivity. In response, government's policy was to subsidize the resulting unemployment. In other words, the state continued to pay workers even when many production centers were closed. Uh, this led to an abrupt contraction in the supply of goods, leading to a suppressed inflation. The Cuban peso, also known as CUP, was in circulation, and the scarcity conditions led people to seek another way to acquire goods, uh, resulting in the emergency of the secondary markets, also known as the black market or informal market. As expected, prices rose drastically, and the value of the CUP plummeted leading to an increased mistrust in this currency due to his instability. Between 1990 and 1993, Cubans began to use an alternative currency that will provide greater security to pay for goods to the secondary markets, the US dollars. Thus, the Cuban government adopted the use of, of dollars in 1994 to let it introduce another currency that will be linked to the dollar called the Cuban Convertible Peso, CUC, in 1995. The state began to sell goods and services in these currencies in special stores, uh, initially aimed at tourists and for those recipients of remittances, in order to collect the dollars that entered to the Cuban market. In 2004, and under the George W. Bush administration, the US government intensified the persecution of bank that carried out Cuban operations. In response, uh, Cuba decided to de-dollarize the economy and left the CUC as the currency with the highest purchasing power without dispensing with the CUP, excuse me, uh, with an exchange rate of one for one in the business sector and another of one for 25 uh, CUP for the rest of the people. On the exchange rates, in the case of companies, the income generated by exports uh, is underestimated and the cost of imports is lowered, uh, which for a small economy highly dependent of the external sector such as Cuba is very contraproductive. Furthermore, uh, various exchange rates tend to make it difficult to measure the economy. Uh, given that the same company could register operation in CUC and dollars at an exchange rate that do not reflect the economy's reality. Therefore, seen from a technical point of view, monetary unification has an implicit negative impact in the short term, not only because it, impl it implies uh, a change of mindset in a management system of the economy and accounting records, but also because it distorts uh, the current price formations affecting purchasing, purchasing power, which ultimately generates social costs. To minimize its impact, the government looked for a way to reduce this social cost, being the most sensitive area, of course. It applied a reform to personal income that increased wages, pensions, and social assistance to sustain consumption levels. At the same time, it was decided to invert the salary scale and favor those workers according to their social, to their social uh, contribution. Within the new scheme, uh, the government also identified uh, vulnerable people as well as ways to offer them the necessary help for social from social consumers' funds. It went from a concept of subsidizing products to one of subsidizing people. Although the freeze is not completely abandoned either, uh, since the consumption subsidy continues, continues to be in order of the 30 billion pesos. As the Cuban economy authorities have underscored, uh, the state budget has two additional large entries, 18 billion 
or to attend companies that have economic problems during the first years of the monetary unification and another uh, 700 millions uh, to help vulnerable uh, people. 43 macro macroeconomic uh, indicators were designed, including the public debt GDP radio. And there is a group of indicators referring to the population's expectations. According to official data, more than 50% of the expected CUC has been collected already, uh, which range from 600 to 700 million at a rate of 11 to 12 million on a daily basis. As part of the process, it is assess the application of novel measure for the Cuban economy, although they are widely used in the rest of the world. This represents another example of the process of dating our model, our economic model, of course. For example, it has been discussed the possibility to finance the budget deficit for which the issuance of public debt bonds was approved for sales to individuals and state companies. This system has a partial development in Cuba, uh, since it has existed since 2014, when it was agreed that up to 70% uh, of the deficit could be financed by bonds, with bonds, uh, but issued by the Ministry of Finance only for the central bank. Now, is, it is possible for the rest of the companies and uh, individuals to get these bonds too. The socialization of this measure would allow, of course, the deficit to be financed with non-bank money uh, that is already in circulation. If achieved properly, it will extract liquidity and lower inflationary pressures in the short and medium term. As might be expected, it has technical complexity, of course, since it will entail creating a public debt market of which there is not much experience of using it in our economy. The monetary unification is planned to boost the economy, to make it more transparent and promote an export mindset instead of, a, of an import one. All this should lead uh, in the medium term to a reactivation of the economy through a more accurate identification of inefficiencies in the business sector, which allowed more accurate measures to be taken. It allows determining the activities by profitability levels and potential growth in each one uh, for a more efficient distribution of resources. Luckily, we are what we measure. The design of economy and social policy is based on our statistical system and data collections, which make it essential to have the most accurate structure of records and measurements of economy events. An orderly monetary and exchange policy will facilitate a more objective, objective uh, evaluation of the economy at the micro and macro level, therefore a very designed of the development policies in the medium and long term. As we have previously stated, it is a complex tax, uh, seeing its faces as supply deficit alongside with that increase in people's income from wages, pensions, and social assistance, an increase in the cost of non-state form, and a high budget deficit, which always carries inflationary risk. One of the most discussed topics on the subject of monetary unification are the condition and the timing in which the leadership of the revolution decided to undertake these measures. More recent history has taught us uh, that the ideal condition are not only very difficult to achieve, but are seldom accompanied by a favorable environment, which is greatly influenced by the economic blockade imposed by the United States. The approach undertaken by the Obama administration in the, in the economic and commercial sphere will have allowed establishing the timing for uh, the implementation uh, of a uh, unification in more favorable conditions. Uh, quite the opposite of the SNR finally happening since Cuba probably, probably experienced the greatest political setback and tightening of the economic blockade during the Trump administration. In my opinion, the Cuba government decision to undertake a monetary reform 
on even on the adverse economic condition is an example uh, of self-determination and autonomous uh, development policy, which cannot under any circumstances uh, be subject to political alternation in the White House. Basically, all the achievements of the revolution in economical, political, and social matters have been accomplished under a strong economic uh, blockade and an attempt at political isolation against our country. The strong and deeply uh, rooted social vocation of the Cuban revolution prevents uh, the application of neoliberal recipes consistent in drastic reduction in the, def in the fiscal deficit at the expense of social programs. Hence, our government has declared that it will not leave anyone unprotected, as well as taking into account opinions and, su and suggestions at all levels. And as an example of this are the corrections that have been made regarding prices. Uh, well, I think uh, with this, I conclude my remarks, which I hope uh, has been helpful for the audience to understand, at least in part of the process of updating the Cuban economy. Uh, I would like to reiterate once again my gratitude to the organizers for the invitation to this panel. So uh, I look forward to the uh, question and answer sessions that we can, of course, uh, have a, a good interchange there. So thanks a lot. I back to you, Ask. Thank you, Alejandro. And I think uh, you've underlined uh, how difficult the process of development is, particularly for countries of the global south, much less a country such as Cuba that faces an unrelenting economic war from the United States. What I think really stood out, I mean, both presentations, particularly in yours, Alejandro, is that Cuba is taking on a very complex task um, in terms of updating its economy, but this is not shock therapy. Uh, this is not going to be a process That's in which right. people are left to fend for themselves. So thank you very much. I also think uh, the heightened interest in Cuba as an example of what countries can do in very difficult economic situations and in a world that presents which is which fraught with so many dangerous challenges is reflected by the fact that we over, have over 300 people participating and listening, and I'm sure we'll have lots of questions. Our next speaker is Dr. Helen Yaffe, a professor at the University of Glasgow. Dr. Yaffe has done important research and published on Cuba's amazing medical advances and internationalism, and is the author of Che Guevara, The Economics of Revolution, and the latest book, which I'm sure a lot of you are reading or have heard about, We Are Cuba, How a Revolutionary People Have Survived in a Post-Soviet World that was published by Yale University Press. Uh, Helen has been on numerous webinars, uh, speaking not only about the Cuban economy, but specifically about Cuba's role in fighting fighting um, COVID-19, not only internationally, but what it's done domestically and particularly in terms of what it's been able to do in terms of biopharmaceuticals and vaccines. Helen, the floor is yours. Thank you, Isaac. Can I start while I'm um, trying to find the slides that I'm going to share by thanking Isaac and Asa and all the people. I know there's, I don't know, dozens of people who are uh, behind this, um, another really important webinar. And I really salute your effort it's fantastic and it's great to be joined by other uh, female academics taking a stand with Cuba so <laughs> um, let me see if I can successfully share that can you all see that yeah okay great so um, I am an incurable historian I'm going to start with a bit of history um, just going back you know what is the embargo stroke blockade all about well, what I have put here is, uh, you know, what are its objectives? This is, some of you will have heard of this. I don't know if many of you will have seen it, but this is the famous memorandum from the 6th of April, 1960, from Deputy Assistant Secretary of State for Inter-American Affairs, Malroy, uh, to the Assistant of Secretary, blah, 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 you know, an internal document. And the subject is the decline and fall of Fidel Castro. What are, um, it says here, the salient considerations respecting the life of the present Cuban government. Here we have a picture of um, the guerrilla army, you know, coming into Havana and being cheered and greeted by the Cuban masses. So this is recognized, the popularity of the Cuban revolution, uh, you know, one year and a half almost on. The majority of Cubans support Castro, recognize 
uh, these um, these you know policymakers. There's no effective political opposition. They note the um, movement towards and, and collaboration with known communists and the communist influence and so on. And they say the only foreseeable means of alienating internal support is through disenchantment, disenchantment and disaffection based on economic dissatisfaction and hardship. And what conclusion do they draw? That every possible means should be undertaken promptly to weaken the economic life of Cuba. The result would be a positive, if the result would be a positive decision, if we're coming forth, this line of action, so on and so forth, um, it should be done in an adroit and inconspicuous way that makes the greatest inroads in denying money and supplies to Cuba to decrease monetary and real wages. And here is the crux, to bring about hunger desperation and overthrow of government. So there you have it, the initial objective of the United States blockade. And that is why the Cubans call it a blockade, which is a, a warfare, an economic warfare against an entire people rather than a set of sanctions to, uh, to punish or a unilateral decision to punish bad behavior as they um, see it. So what has been, I'm going to focus not on the monetary unification because I knew that Emily and now we see that others as well would um, be looking at that question. I'm going to focus on the impact of the blockade on the health sector. So it has been estimated that the accumulated monetary damage to the health sector since 1961 has been over 3 billion. Uh, the total damage, the cost of the blockade um, to the Cuban economy is estimated at over 134 billion in total. So the Cuban healthcare is impacted by the US blockade because it's impeded from accessing medical technologies and equipment, medical reagents for diagnosis, diagnostic tools, medicines and medical supplies under these conditions that 10% or more of a piece of equipment has a, a component made in the US or by a US subsidiary. And when you think about the um, overwhelming domination of US biopharma companies in this sector, that you know, would get you thinking how difficult that is. That is not just um, a measure that applies to medical equipment, that's equipment on, on any any scale. So when they were, um, they had foreign companies interested in doing the uh, exploration for the deep sea oil, they had to make new equipment, you know, th that that didn't have US components at all. They're also obstructive if the vendor is US owned, a US subsidiary or has substantial business with the US. And also, there's the question of transportation, because transportation um, if it's carried out by a US property or, or property a company that has business with the US. You know this rule that if ships that unload in Cuba have um, been prohibited under US regulations from stopping in the US for six months. So there's also um, beyond the sort of direct blocking of, of goods is the persecution of financial transactions. Cuba cannot use the dollar in international transactions, but the dollar is the international currency. So even donations for Cuban healthcare are blocked because they rely on being collected in international banks and being uh, transferred through international financial institutions. So just looking a little bit about what happened with the Trump administration in terms of the intensification of the blockade. Pre-19, uh, sorry, pre-2016 election, Trump said, you know, he was fine with the deal with Cuba. Evidence came out that he'd sent his business cronies to, to, to investigate the possibility of setting up businesses in Cuba. He had no problem with that. It was just a market for him. The political cost of rapprochement had been paid by the Obama administration. So what happened? Well, apparently in May 2017, 
Flores is Senator Marco Rubio storms into Trump and demands that he reverses rapprochement. And Rubio held leverage because he had a key role in the Senate. They had a one seat majority. And he also then joined subsequently the committee investigating the, you know, the Russiagate affair. So effectively, Trump did what most US presidents have done and outsourced his Cuban policy to the um, right wing Cuban exile community, and in this case, to Rubio. And so he goes uh, to Miami and declares in mid-June, I'm cancelling the last administration's completely one-sided deal with Cuba. Subsequent to that, we had the close or the, the reduction by 60% of embassy staff in Havana under the spurious accusation that has still not been proven of sonic attacks, which is now being called microwave attacks. And subsequently, they settled for the Havana syndrome, um, but effectively uh, hampering the, the restoration of diplomatic relations by um, gutting the US embassy and you know expelling uh, Cuban diplomats as well. So in 2000, uh, sorry, in November uh, 2017, we had this list of restricted entities and any Cuban entity that was on that list, no one could do business with them. And, and then the measures started to come thick and fast. And May 2019, very important, you had the um, lifting of the suspension after 23 years of Title III of the Helms-Burton Act. And in total, there have been more than 240 new sanctions, actions and measures taken under the Trump administration with the objective to create that economic suffering which was clearly articulated in the 1960 document. And the result has been a serious deterioration of conditions in Cuba, shortages of oil, shortages of food, of medicines, long queues, people getting up at four and five in the morning to have to queue for shops that don't open till 10 or 11. And of course, the government is using its socialist apparatus, its state control over production and distribution to ensure that while there is scarcity, it is essentially distributed fairly and that people have access to, to you know, basics to keep them alive. I was in Cuba in December and, Jan and early January this year, and I have to say that um, despite having lived in Cuba in the middle of the special period in the 1990s, I have never seen the level of scarcity and queuing, which I saw in this period. Okay, so what has been the impact in terms of COVID-19? Well, since the pandemic began, there has been around 50, almost 50 action sanctions and measures introduced by the Trump administration. And that is despite the United Nations calling on countries to suspend and lift sanctions, particularly those targeting humanitarian, um, you know, questions of food, medicines and so on. Very early on, a huge donation that was made by Jack Ma, um, who's the owner director of Alibaba company, um, donation of PPE, medical equipment and so on, uh, couldn't stop in, there was a refusal to take the stuff to Cuba because it was going on a US plane. Cuba subsequently couldn't buy ventilators or spare parts because the previous supplier, a Swiss manufacturer, had been bought out by a US company in 2018. And this is despite them being absolutely clear on the, the importance that ventilators were gonna play. They could see it being played out in other countries in the ICU units. And there's also been at the same time an intensification of the campaign to discredit Cuban medical internationalism, even while thousands of Cuban specialists in disease control and disaster response have been to dozens of uh, countries specifically to treat COVID-19 patients. So I'm just going to give you an example of, um, you know, how, how deep and how, um, well, how deeply the blockade runs and how, how broadly it affects. There, there was a, a fund, currently a fundraiser being set up um, to help Cuba with its effort to purchase the medical equipment, particularly syringes that it needs 
to carry out its mass vaccination campaign. And I hope we can talk um, a little bit more about this incredible accomplishment of Cuba, which is very close to starting its phase three trials of one out of four of its homegrown domestically produced vaccines. Um, the, the fundraiser was blocked first by Crowdfunder UK and then by Just Giving. Why? Because they use financial payment systems, which are uh, either um, from the US or affected by the US blockade. So um, I'm encouraging people, I hope someone can share this link in the chat. There's a petition to demand that Just Given and Crowdfunder stop implementing the US blockade of Cuba. What can we do more broadly? Events like this are great. Um, in the US, you know, I'm, I'm in Glasgow, in Scotland, in, in Britain, in case anyone didn't know. Um, in the US, it's keep mobilizing, keep organizing events like this to demand an end to the blockade. But I think the demand should be no more slow, incremental steps. What is required from the administration at the political level is big, irreversible changes. Outside of the United States, we need to have lawyers who are prepared to initiate legal challenges um, against the extraterritorial imposition of the US embargo. And I've talked about this in other forums. It is actually legally, a it's a violation of laws in Britain and Canada, in the EU, in many countries around the world to allow OFAC to implement fines and to impose the blockade against um, you know, citizens of, of other countries. The US in, uh, blockade should be a question for US territory and US interests, and it is illegal the way that it's been imposed on the rest of the world. So that has to happen alongside political mo mobilization. So I'd encourage anyone here, if you're a lawyer, if you know any lawyers, then that's the kind of action that I think needs to be taken at this stage. Let people know how the US blockade never negatively affects them and the rest of the world, not just Cuba. So, you know, there was a, um, a part of the demands that have been made is about the interferon alpha 2b uh, antiviral drug that Cuba has, but they also have a drug called Just Vinsa, which is showing incredible results for patients with COVID-19 in a critical state. It's preventing the uh, inflammatory response, which is um, you know, basically uh, one of the contributing factors to fatalities. So you know, we need to know about these. There's a lung cancer immunotherapy, which is already under trial in Roswell Park. Cuba has um, um, a medicine which reduces the need for diabetic foot ulcer amputations by 71%. That means statistically that 52,000 people in the United States could be saved from the need for amputations every year. So we need to share ideas, coordinate actions. I saw that there's someone here from the uh, Cuba Support Group Island. They've got a wonderful campaign, Walking for Cuba. They've got an interactive map so you can do a walk, hold the banner at the flag of Cuba uh, in the blockade signs and put yourself on the map so it can become a, a global movement. And support medical aid for Cuba because they need support right now in terms of resources to facilitate their mass vaccination campaign. And that's me. Thank you so much, uh, Dr. Helen Yaffe. Thank you for staying up with us tonight. I know it's pretty late uh, across uh, the ocean uh, where you are. So uh, thank you for your presentation and, and specifically um, bringing up and speaking on, on the effects of the, um, the US blockade, the unjust and cruel blockade. Um, on Cuba, I think I wrote down um, something that you said that I think is basically frames uh, today's webinar and, and our momentum and our action, which is big irreversible change. Uh, and I think that is the point is that we need to fight against the blockade, um, that we need to get together to do that. So thank you for bringing your perspective with us today. And uh, before um, inviting and introducing our, our next um, speaker, I actually wanted to say a virtual hello to all our, our Cuban uh, friends that are watching us through Facebook. Uh, as you might know, uh, Zoom um, is blockaded in Cuba because of the United States blockade. Zoom is a US corporation. Um, but uh, I can see on Facebook a lot of our friends from the Instituto Cubano, uh, ECAP from uh, the Cuban Institute of Friendship with the People. Hola a todas y todas. Gracias para estar con nosotros hoy. Uh, thank you for being here with us today. Um, so next, uh, I will have the pleasure to invite uh, Dr. Tamara Lee. 
Uh, she's an assistant professor uh, in labor studies and employment relations department at Rutgers School of Management and Labor Relations. Her academic work supports two separate research streams, critical race theory and intersectionality in industrial relations and worker political participation in Cuban industrial relations. Welcome, Tammy. Hi, thank you. Um, I just want to say to everyone, I got a friendly warning from the labor or the language justice folks to go very slowly. So I'm going to try to do that deliberately. Um, and so hopefully you don't get too bored with um, um, the lethargic speech pattern I hope I have. Um, so I just want to say quickly um, in response to Helen's call to action, and especially for those of you who are in the United States, like myself. Um, I am a member of ACERE, ACERE, which stands for the Alliance for Cuban uh, Engagement and Respect. And we are uh, right now, and you can go to us at ACERE.org, and um, we have a, a letter that we're asking all of the Congress people to get on board and sign asking for really, really specific set of demands of the new administration in terms of the embargo and other policies, including sanctions um, that are currently in place against Cuba. And it's our hope to get 100 Congress people at least to sign on to the letter. So please go there and then call your representative and ask them to sign on to the letter. Um, okay, so I am so excited to be here on the panel. Um, when I did my doctoral thesis on Cuban work, worker participation, I was so happy to have had a body of work that existed uh, from Helen and Isaac in particular that I never would have been able to, to get the dissertation done without them. So I'm so glad to be uh, on this call with them. Um, I was asked to be on the panel to talk about what lessons Cuba holds for the labor movements in other nations in which we are under an oppressive neoliberal economic situation. And it turns out there's a great deal to learn from Cuba about very many things, but worker participation is one in which they are above and beyond almost any other nation state. So let me go through a little bit of the research from the data I had back during the time when, um, as Isaac mentioned briefly on his introduction, when the Cuban people were in negotiation with the state over what the new Cuban socialism would look like. And I want to just give you just a visual of what that process was like, but I really want to focus on how we would prepare workers and the labor movement to be able to engage in participation at the levels in which the Cuban workers were able to participate. Okay, so I put together a little slideshow. You always know an academic by a PowerPoint. Sorry about it. Um, so I think one thing in terms of looking as Q at Cuba as a model is that we also have to sort of respect how great Cuba is at some things that we may not be able to accomplish at this moment in our political economies. One of those things is that Cuba has a tremendous structure, institutional structure post-revolution that they have embedded in several constitutional amendments since the 70s, which provides very, very clear um, and, and enforceable uh, institutions for workers to have rights to debate and discuss with the state all of the changes to the economic system and their labor conditions. This is something that we do not have in the United States, by the way, uh, and you have no worker democracy in the United States unless you have a union, and we know the status of unions at the, at, uh, currently in the United States. So unlike the U.S. and other neoliberal type political economies, Cuba has done the institutional work to guarantee that workers have a constitutional and a statutory right uh, 
to engage in a conversation, a dialogue, a, a participation when it comes to economic reform at critical moments. And the thing about Cuba is that unlike other situations, we usually would expect that at moments of, of great economic crisis, what usually happens to worker voice is that it decreases drastically. Um, but Cuba has been performing quite the opposite for some time. And in fact, whenever Cuba has been at a critical moment, in its political economy when it had to make really, really tough economic decisions, their wor worker participation increases, right? I mean, this is an amazing thing about Cuba, but it's also something that we like to uh, serve as a model that there are ways in which we can ensure that workers have a voice when there's economic crisis. Um, and so my research in Cuba, Sorry, do you all hear that echo? Okay. Um, so my research in Cuba actually did, in fact, uh, show that Cuban workers do have a meaningful worker participation. It's not just on paper. It's not just in the Constitution that it's actually occurring. Um, and when we say meaningful worker voice in economic reform, what we're really saying is they have a right and they have influence over state-initiated proposals, right? But they also have not only the right, but the technical capacity to create their own policy during economic crisis, right? So this is something that is very unique to Cuba that we hope to you know, serve as a model to other places. So what I wanna focus on is the part about how to prepare workers for participating in political and economic change. Because um, short of a revolution, I know in the United States, we're not going to get the kind of statutory and constitutional rights that Cuba has um, successfully given to its society, right? So let's focus on the stuff that we can do now, which is what can we do? What can we learn from Cuba in terms of how to prepare workers to, to participate in political economic reform? Um, so most of my opinion about this, my, my academic opinion, comes from the fact that I just went to Cuba and enrolled in their trade union university to learn from them directly what we can do to, in order to grow a labor movement that can counter neoliberalism, right? So it doesn't have to be Tammy from Rutgers telling, helping you imagine what Cuba would do. Cuba actually has a model that it exports to other nation states and unions and workers and leaders about the things you need in order to build worker consciousness to the level in which you could oppose neoliberalism. And what does that look like? Um, so I wanna talk to you about the extent of labor education in Cuba, and then how in fact that might be a model um, for other political economies that are trying to oppose neoliberalism. Um, so probably not to the surprise of this audience, the labor education program is extensive in Cuba. Um, it is at multiple levels of, of, of society. So it's in the enterprise, it's in the provinces, it's at the national level. And it is actual technical and ideological training for workers and union leaders in order to be able to have these high level discussions about policy. Um, so we're looking at 2010, 2011, and 2012 specifically. I'm pointing this out because that was the time in which the Cuban workers were engaged in a really intense and, and you know, from my perspective, a very beautiful conversation with the state about what Cuban socialism needs to look like going forward. And it was just really a great time to watch not only how we, they trained workers to participate, but then to watch that participation in real time. Um, so I took two courses at the Trade Union University. They had a national university that was outside of Havana. I think this location right now is used for other things, but there is basically a campus with a dorm and all the Cuban uh, labor leaders and workers, as well as international students would come to learn from uh, the Cuban, learn the Cuban model for labor education. 
And of course, you know, I talked to the members of the CTC, that's on the left. The CTC, if you don't know, is the Central Trade Union uh, of Trade Federation um, in Cuba. And then also we talked to some state officials, of course. Um, and then you visit the workplaces to actually see the workers participating at the enterprise level in their worker assemblies. One thing that's really important about Cuba is, and unlike the United States, the workplace actually turns out to be the center of of political conversation um, for the workers, right? Imagine that in the United States if we were just talking political advocacy all the time in the workplace, um, in the private sector. But so in Cuba, the workers are participating at their enterprise level. The picture on the right is also a community center. So workers not only can participate at their enterprise, they also can communicate or, um, their, their, their opinions about political and economic uh, debates in community centers. And so I also visited those during that time. Um, so to set sort of the context for where, for what the union's role in all of this is, I want to talk a little bit about the state just a little bit. Um, and so, you know, when Fidel comes in and he has an educational revolution, there are a couple of things that are really important to set the stage for why the union could come in and do what the work that it did. And first is that um, you know, when you're trying to do a transformation from, from capitalism to socialism or some other type of system that is fairer or has more um, role for worker voice, what you have to do is um, have a process of training workers in what the collective identity would be, right? So democracy is, um, is, is intentionally linked to worker participation. And this is a very important concept um, for, for training workers to engage in this type of debate. Um, the other thing is that any sort of educator in the Cuban system is at least two identities at once. They themselves are supposed to be exemplary workers. And so they are modeling the kind of behavior that workers should have, but they are also educators of future workers. And so that's going to really factor in when we talk about what the responsibility is uh, of labor leaders in trying to build the kind of worker consciousness we need in other political economies to try to have the type of voice that workers in Cuba have. These are just some pictures of the, the schools, the trade union schools that are in the provinces in Cuba. So what does the, the trade union do um, in terms of labor education? I put these stats up there. I can provide these slides for people later, um, so you don't have to really read that if you don't if you don't want to. But in these sort of brick and mortar uh, classrooms, they are training a lot of union leaders and a lot of rank and file people. And when I say training, that means that folks get to leave work and come to the school for however long the training program is. They don't lose salary or benefits. This is an education that is free. And they go and they train at these brick and mortar places. But again, remember that you don't have to go to a school in order to train enough for participation. There's also a lot of education going on at the enterprise level, right? And we're talking about training in things like labor law, workplace rights, grievance handling, participatory education, consensus building. So what are the fundamental concepts that I think that are important for union leaders and other contexts to learn from Cuba? One is that union leaders are responsible for, of course, constructing worker consciousness and mobilizing a unified labor movement. I think a lot of struggles, particularly in the United States, is um, what is the identity that we're trying to build uh, a movement around? Right, we have to have a better conversation, a clearer conversation about what the collective identity is in any other political economy. Um, the other thing I wanted to talk about in terms of uh, the education process is that in the Cuban system um, and the way participatory democracy works there, there is an emphasis on unity of thought, but that does not require unanimity. And I think sometimes the labor movement in the United States gets caught up on 
um, the fragmentation of identities in our labor movements? Should we focus on Black workers? Should we focus on women? Should we focus on Indigenous people? And sometimes those uh, the, the things that are different about us tend to break our, our unification. And so we have to learn and we can learn from the Cuban process about how to build a unity that recognizes our differences, right? Uh, it doesn't require us all to be the same, but recognizes where we all are in trying to build a worker's consciousness. Um, I just wanted to give you a snapshot of the curriculum. Um, and so we're talking about education in um, like a post-secondary education almost, right? Economics, management, international labor policy. Um, I was struck immediately by how much workers know um, before they go into any sort of consultation. Um, people know their constitutional rights. People know their statutory rights. People know what's changing. Um, our Cuban colleagues talk to us about changes to the monetary system, changes to um, the quinta pro piece does the self-employment sector. If you walk around the streets of Cuba and ask any worker, they will know <laughs> what's going on in each of those things. And so it is really a crucial thing that the union does in terms of making sure that education comes um, across workers at all levels. Um, and so what is it that Cuba can tell us about labor education? Well, I'll tell you exactly what's in their international labor education program. Um, they, they cover the same things they cover for Cuban labor leaders and workers, but then they also um, build a program around what your specific uh, nation state needs, right? What, what your specific union movement needs. Um, and one of the courses that I took for union instructors, really, you can see what the curriculum looked like there. Um, before we can have labor movements that try to attack neoliberalism, we have to have a workforce that understands what neoliberalism is and put it in a global context and is not so much a US hegemony in the way in which we see the relationships between um, global capital, right? And so we have to sort of relearn or learn for the first time what all these processes are that are holding back labor movements in neoliberal states, right? So. All of these sorts of things like um, um, gender and social transformation, the role of tra trade unions in the global political economy is high level education, at least in the US context, um, but is very necessary if, if, if the labor movement is going to be able to participate at any point in these type of macro level political and economic decision making. Um, this is just another list of, uh, of, of, of the content of a course uh, for union leaders. And you can see again, this focus on, let's look at the global context and what the role of US imperialism has been on the regions in Latin America and in all over the world. And then what is the responsibility of the labor movement in the United States for making change and building a labor movement that is global, right? And so in order to do that, we have to learn about the ILO, we have to learn about the European Union, we have to learn about alternatives to liberate or uh, to neoliberalism in the Latin American states, right. So again, it's a fairly extensive education. Um, and it's and it's really at a world class level. So I want to sort of wrap up because I know we're, we're, we're running late and I can answer anything on Q&A, either about the participatory process or the labor education system in Cuba. But there are a couple of things I want us to think about in terms of why Cuba is a good model for us. Um, one of them is that labor education is super important in creating a more participatory democracy. Even if we had the institutions that Cuba has, do we have the, the knowledge uh, to participate and make good decisions that will make our political and economic situation better? 
Um, also, I think that we need to recognize that Cuba has long been a model for all types of other political economies outside of the unit, United States in, in particular, but, but Cuba has, is a world leader in terms of how to make this transformation from, social, from neoliberalism or capitalism to socialism. And we should look at uh, them in terms of what they're doing at the macro level in, in terms of what we're searching for as a movement. Um, and then of course, I think that Cuba is a good model for potential labor movement revitalization in the United States. Uh, maybe, right, if unions want to be more important in the United States and grow to a density that's greater than 11% or 13%, what we need to do is maybe consider how important education is to actually mobilizing workers in a movement against the policies of an imperial US. Okay, I'll stop there. Uh, thank you, Tammy, uh, for that very detailed and comprehensive pr presentation on uh, Cuba's workers' participation. Uh, we're running a little, we're running behind schedule, but we're open uh, <coughs> if if um, but it's dependent on a number of things of actually extending our question period. Uh, that depends on a number of things. The it depends on the stamina and the strength and the energy of our interpreters as well. But uh, this is uh, but the fact that we have 290 people still left on, and the fact that uh, you know we have all sorts of questions going on in the chat and so forth, and a question and answer, I think demonstrates how much people are interested in this. Um, one point before we move on to Dr. Emily Morris is that what it, uh, it's important to also remember that these moments of worker participation in Cuba, where Cuba becomes this vast island parliament, are not just aberrations. In 1994, there was a very famous workers' parliament when Cuba was the height of this um, a, a special period, where over 80,000 meetings took place to sort of sort out a direction of how Cuba was going to deal with the economic crisis it was facing uh, with the collapse of the Soviet Union and the, uh, uh, at that time. Uh, so with so we have, a, we have lots of questions we have, uh, that people want to have answered. And uh, we have our last speaker, but not least, which is Dr. Emily Morris, who is a research fellow at UCL, London's Global University. Uh, she's a development economics specializing in Latin America and the Caribbean. Uh, she has been senior uh, editor um, at The Economist uh, in, uh, in terms of Latin America and head of country reports at the Economist Intelligence Unit in London from 1995 to 2008. I actually met her in Cuba when she was actually doing work for the Economist Intelligence Unit in the 90s. And she has been a country economist for Belize at the Inter-American Development Bank from 2014 to 2017. Her most recent teaching includes Latin American economics beyond neoliberalism and the transformation of Cuba and the economics of quantitative components of researching the Americas and globalization and Latin America development. Since returning to UCL in 2017, she has been working to establish UCL, uh, a UCL Cuba research network. And I also noticed in her biography that in the many universities she's taught at, she also taught at my alma, alma mater, uh, the School of Oriental and African Studies, uh, which is part of the University of London system where I did my PhD as well. So without any further ado, uh, Emily, you have the floor. Thank you very much. You can hear me okay? Thank you very much um, for inviting me to this thing. I'm going to share my screen now um, and see if that works. Yeah, I think that's it. That should be it. Share that. Yeah. Okay. So yeah, I'm. Is can everybody see the the the? Uh, yeah. Yes, we can see the screen. Lovely. Okay. All right. Well, I I know we're running behind, and also I've been listening very carefully to everybody else that's been speaking, and and I'm um, pleased that um, our Cuban participants have already given some description of what's going on. Helen's talking, talked about it. I discussed this with Helen before we decided to have a division of labor so that I would talk about the, <clears throat> the new economic challenges and policies. So I'm not gonna talk about the blockade in particular. I'm not gonna talk about the COVID-19 pandemic. At least I'm not going to focus on those. I'm just going to focus on the new um, economic challenges and policies at the moment. Now, we've already had the history lessons, so I'm going to skip over the next um, slide. I'm an economist, so I had to put in a slide with the economic data and the GDP and so on. But just to say that the current, to underline the fact that the current moment 
is the latest in a long series of um, crises and adjustment over the last 30 years. Um, and so this chart just follows the GDP story that we have with the collapse at the beginning of the 1990s and then growth fluctuating in between. And this last year of 2020, where the estimated GDP um, contraction was 11%. Now, obviously that's the um, largest contraction for a very long time. It matches the beginning of the special period, but it is only, well, it should be only a one year contraction, not like the special period, which was over three or four years. Um, the next slide shows the level of GDP. So the, the first one was the right-hand axis, and this one's on the left-hand axis, and it shows using an index for 1989 is 100, what happened to GDP, real GDP over that period. It's not real GDP per head, but population growth in Cuba has been very, very um, slow. So it, pretty close to real GDP per head over that period. There are all sorts of problems with measuring GDP, but it's a, it's, um, the overall trend is pretty much, pretty reliable and accepted. And what you see there is the contraction by a third at the beginning of the 1990s, a long, slow recovery with an acceleration, of course, um, in 2004 to 2008 as a result of the Venezuela deal. But it's been a, um, a difficult journey back to the previous level of national income. And then there's been a rise in the past few years, the growth level hasn't been very high. And then the downturn from 2019, and then finally in 2020. And the, the impact of US actions was really felt most strongly in from 2019 onwards. So even before COVID happened, the very rapid um, decline in US visitors had had a severe effect on the Cuban economy. And the third line I'll show here is actually the import spending. And it shows the close relationship at the beginning with the collapse in import capacity, which is what pulled down um, GDP growth. So very much showing that it was an external shock that caused the problem. Then you had fluctuations, wild fluctuations in the oil price, which causes some of the disturbance later on. And then right at the end, you have this um, renewed collapse in um, imports because of the shortage of foreign exchange, because of US sanctions and COVID. So over that period, there have been these various stages. There was a periodo especial, and then followed by a stabilization policy, which was discussed. And then there was a period of freezing US-Cuban relations when Cuba felt very much under threat. And then um, the, the kind of economic reforms or changes um, slowed during that period uh, as Cuba moved towards Venezuela. Um, but then by 2008, there was a problem. The overdependence on the Venezuelan trade left Cuba exposed. Um, there was a global crisis and a very sharp correction. That's the correction in import spending um, in 2009. And then you've got the period of lineamientos. Um, you still have oil price volatility and you have um, part of the lineamientos was actually renegotiating um, Paris Club debt. And that's very important because it's one of the reasons for the slow growth during that period is that Cuba was trying to sort out its external accounts. It was trying to restore its access to international borrowing, which had been so um, cripplingly expensive, expensive. And so they were trying to improve their, their position in that way. Um, but as a result, this kind of adjustment suppressed growth a little bit during that period. And then you have the latest challenge with um, Trump and COVID-19. So we've got 30 years of, of crisis and updating and hardships and achievements, because what's important to see is, and as I've argued before, is that the, although there was a lot of suffering, a lot of hardship and, and difficulties, Cuba's performance was actually pretty good considering the constraints that it was under. And what was even more impressive was, of course, the fact that um, the social safety net 
held up even in the worst period, unlike the other countries of the former Soviet bloc. So um, coming to what's going on now though, what most of the crises caused up until now have been caused by external shocks. The current crisis um, or yeah, moment that we had is actually a, a shock caused by an economic policy chosen by Cuba to try to correct the um, dual currency that had, as I think it was Alejandro explained, had developed during the period of crisis in the 1990s, but hasn't been solved since. So at the center of it is the currency adjustment and the devaluation of the official exchange rate from one to one through the CUC to 24 to one. That's a massive devaluation. It's not a 2,300% devaluation because I don't actually see how anything can devalue or fall in value by more than 100%. But um, a lot of people have been talking about that. It's a 96% devaluation, which is dramatic enough as it is. Um, and, uh, but that has gone together. It's not just a devaluation on its own. It's gone together with a huge shock in terms of wages, a sudden increase in the state wage fund by um, fivefold. Um, a reform, a thorough comprehensive reform of the benefit and minimum wage system. The minimum wage is actually new. The benefit system is now tied to the minimum basket. Um, and so this has been carefully thought through um, in order to try to protect the, the poorest and most vulnerable. And at the same time, the non-state sector has no um, cap on earnings, but also uh, no automatic adjustment upwards in, in response to the third part of it, which is an increase in prices. Um, so the state sector companies are now re being required with this new exchange rate to adjust their prices. The prices are all going up because wage costs are going up and import costs are going up. Um, and so this is a controlled process. In the non-state sector, it's also a monitored process where um, uh, profiteering is controlled. So this is um, a, a very complex process. All prices, wages, um, and exchange rates throughout the economy are changing at the same time. This is very, very unnerving, destabilizing, worrying for everybody. Um, so these three shocks have been introduced. Um, the reason why they've been introduced is for the potential rewards. All economists, without exception, argue that the exchange rate system has been distorted distortionary, the Cubans understand that it's been distortionary, everybody knows that the incentive system has been upside down. And so that if the price is properly uh, adjust to the real cost of things, then there'll be more productivity, efficiency, dynamism and growth. That's not in dispute, all other things being equal in a perfect world, if you had um, more meaningful prices, it would be possible to, to do all of those things. And so that's the um, the hope, that's a reward. But on the other hand, you've got the risks. And um, I think it was Isaac talked about um, not using the word risks, but I think that there are real risks of this process um, if it's not managed well. And the, the risks are economic in terms of instability, but also in terms of um, actually a reduction in output if it's done um, if companies, state companies are not able to adjust fast enough, they will go bankrupt and the, the actual output could be reduced. So it's an economic risk, it's a social risk, they've got radical change and there was a question I saw about um, income distribution. There's a radical change in income distribution. Now nobody likes to be the loser, but some people are going to win and some people are going to lose. The people who are going to lose um, most are going to be people who were formerly receiving income in hard currency, which they could change for Cuban pesos when the prices in the Cuban peso markets were heavily, heavily subsidized. Um, those subsidies are being taken away. And so those people who have got those highly valued um, 
foreign currency are actually going to lose out. And what's happened is you've got a sudden increase in people registering for jobs. A lot of people are operating in the informal economy where they're earning a few dollars. With a few dollars, they could turn those into enough Cuban pesos to live. And those people are being squeezed out of the informal economy and brought back into the formal sector. It's also a political challenge. And certainly the, you can see by the, what the government's been saying, the statements, that this is a very, as people say, complex process. It's full of contradictions. Um, people feel insecure, they feel worried, um, and they get angry with other people if other people are making more money and all the rest of it. So politically, it's a very difficult one to, to handle. It's very important that confidence is maintained. But I think, and so all of those are the risks that are involved. Um, but I think what's interesting about this process, and this does follow very well from the last speaker, um, Tamara Lee, is what she was saying about the way that people are educated in, in participation and all the rest of it. With COVID, unfortunately, you can't have meetings. This is really interesting. That, that, so without meetings, they do have the internet. They have, um, they're opening up the debate through those means, but it's not the same. It's actually been really difficult to do this under these circumstances because of COVID. And I think that's a really interesting thing. Somebody should do a PhD on, on how they um, so rapidly managed to set up systems for feedback and so on through, through the internet, but also through telephones, through going around by trying to gather what people, trying to educate people, trying to get people involved in the discussion about what to do. Um, so this has been a, a hugely difficult process. And you can see at one point, I think um, Diaz Canal was talking about, um, talking to the other leaders, the people in the, I think the Council of Ministers, and he was saying, we mustn't be overwhelmed. And the fact that he used that word suggests that it was feeling overwhelming. Um, but they're still managing to, to keep the social safety net there. Um, through commitment and through participation all the way through. People who are controlling the prices are right at the local level, right where people are. So it's a, it's a fascinating process. It's never been attempted. You know, an exchange rate adjustment at this scale, along with a commitment to social protection, has never been um, attempted. And to do that during a time of COVID and during a time of um, under the uh, worst period in terms of US sanctions is something that's unprecedented. But given Cuba's um, performance in its recent history and getting through these crises, I think that we'd be premature to say that this is going to, that they won't be able to cope with it. But it's, it's not gonna be easy. So on balance, just to say that uh, the ordenamiento it's going along with associated reforms, obviously opening up more of the private sector, but also all of the reforms associated with enterprise reforms and so on, the changes in the law, all of these things are being done at the same time. So there's a big shocks. So I say that it is big shocks, but it's not shock therapy, as Isaac said. The, re the rewards, um, there are rewards eventually, but um, nobody's hiding the fact that in the short term, this is hugely disruptive um, with enormous risks. So it's another major test of Cuba, Cuban resilience. Um, and then just to say very briefly about COVID-19, um, clearly this is being done when we've got additional hardships. Um, and so it's a particularly difficult moment and it really wouldn't be possible without um, the degree of participation and confidence that is there despite everything. I think this is, you know, it's remarkable. And then there's also the vaccinations bringing hope now. Um, and then with Biden coming in, the likely measures, um, and this ties in also with um, what Helen said, you know, there is nowhere near normalization. When we talk about normalization, it's almost, somewhat, you know, people don't even, can't even imagine what normalization would look like. I mean, we are nowhere near normal in, in the relations between Cuba and the United States. The day when trade between the two countries is unimpeded would be um, a very different Cuban economy in very different circumstances. But the measures, you know, 
whatever measures they take could ease the adjustment, but the adjustment is happening anyway. So that's all, I, I hope that I've done it within um, 10 minutes and allow time for questions because there are some very interesting questions, um, including the one on, on uh, uh, income distribution, which I'd like to tackle, but let's, let's open to the chairs. Okay. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Dr. Emily, for your presentation. A, a very, a very comprehensive in-depth presentations on Cuba's economical policies and updates. Uh, thank you for your time. I think you are still sharing your screen. Uh, oh yeah, right. Okay, stop share. There we are. There. Perfect. <laughs> um, so before I, I headed uh, uh, to my co-chair Isaac for uh, getting us started in this Q&A, and, and as you said, Dr. Emily, I think everybody has a lot of good questions today. Um, your presentation, Dr. Helen's presentation, uh, Tammy uh, and our Cuban uh, friends from the, the United Nation, Nation representation of Cuba were all really, um, I think, brought, everybody's, uh, brought everybody a lot of questions. So we'll try to get to as many of them. Uh, but before we get to that, I wanted to make a few announcements of, of some upcoming webinars and upcoming events that I think are interested for you. So um, I'm going to read some of this announcement and, and Aaron Feely Nahum will be posting in the chat the links for them and you'll be able to register and, and find more information. Uh, the first is that tomorrow, uh, Friday, February 26, at 7 p.m. Eastern and 4 p.m. Pacific, uh, the Venceremos Brigade Local Committee invites you to a film screen and panel discussion of the documentary. Can you zoom in, Tamara? Thank you. Of the documentary series, uh, The War on Cuba by Belly of the Beast. Um, the registration link will be posted in the chat uh, to register on Zoom. Uh, on Sunday, February 28th, and this was already posted some of it in the chat, uh, support Cuban families and US economic sanctions caravans will take place in several cities in the United States and Canada. Uh, I know I've seen folks from Miami and other cities have posted the information in the chat. So if there is a caravan taking place this Sunday, February 25th um, in your city in the United States or in Canada, please post it in the chat and invite folks to join you. These caravans, which are led by Cubans in the United States and now Cubans in Canada are joining them are very important and part of this momentum against the blockade. So please share the information about your caravans that are taking place this Sunday in the chat. Uh, the next event I want to invite folks to uh, is on Friday, March 5th at uh, 7 p.m. Eastern, 4 p.m. Pacific. Uh, there will be a webinar to demand U.S., Canada, Hands of Venezuela. Uh, this will be the first monthly picket action on this issue. Um, it is also marking the eighth anniversary since the passing of Comandante Hugo Chavez. A link to register for that webinar will also be posted in the chat. Uh, another event I would like to invite everyone uh, to uh, will be taking place on Sunday, March 14 at 5 p.m. Eastern, 2 p.m. Pacific. And uh, the U.S. Women and Cuba Collaboration and Women's International League for Peace and Freedom uh, invites you all to a webinar titled Feminist Solidarity Celebrating International Women's Day and the Advancement of Cuban Women. Uh, a link to register for that uh, on Zoom will also be posted in the chat, so keep an eye for that. And uh, another important webinar uh, I want to invite you to uh, will be taking place on Wednesday, March 17, uh, at 7 p.m. Eastern at 4 p.m. Pacific. And uh, this time, the Canadian Network on Cuba uh, invites you to their monthly virtual picket action against the U.S. blockade. Again, the registration will be posted on Zoom. Uh, and don't worry about rushing to write all of this down. All is posted on Zoom, so you can go back and copy it. Um, another important webinar uh, that the US Cuba Normalization uh, Committee will be organizing on April 17 um, is a webinar on the literacy campaign and the Playa Heron, uh, which is the defeat of the US mercenary invasion against Cuba. Um, the time will be confirmed, um, and you can find more information by visiting us.cubanormalization.org. Um, this will also be posted in the chat, and this is where you can find our information about how to get involved in our ongoing campaigns and also about upcoming webinars. And I'm almost done with my announcement, I promise we'll be shortly in the Q&A period, but I also wanted to point uh, last two important things. Uh, one is that I have already uh, posted, um, uh, Dr. Helen Yaffe sent us um, some links from their work in the UK that I've already posted in the chat. I see the chat is extremely active, so I will repost them again uh, if you miss them. 
And also, in addition to that, there's a, a, the National Network on Cuba has a petition condemning the US government for adding Cuba to the so-called uh, state sponsors of terrorism list. So a link to sign that petition will also be posted in the chat. And uh, lastly uh, is uh, uh, Janine Solanke, who's the national coordinator of the Che Guevara uh, Volunteer Work Brigade to Cuba, which was the way for me. My first time to travel to Cuba was through this Volunteer Work Brigade. Uh, she just asked me uh, to let people know about this upcoming way to be able to uh, visit Cuba and that uh, she'll post her information in the chat so you can get a hold of her. Uh, but I also noticed that Gail Walker from IPCO and some other folks have been also in the chat. So I encourage you, uh, please, uh, if you are here from the Pastors for Peace Caravan, uh, the May Day Brigade or the Venceremos Brigade, post some updates or some information or your contacts in the chat. So folks can know about what are the ways they can participate and go to Cuba as long as and as soon as it will be safe to do so. Um, those are my uh, little few announcements. Thank you all. And uh, Isaac, the floor is yours. Yeah. And you know, with all those announcements, it demonstrates how much activity is going on about Cuba. Cuba occupies a space in people's consciousness and a sense of actually trying perhaps to create with all uh, a better world with all the difficulties that the world is fraught with. Cuba seems to stand out as an example. I want to thank our panelists, particularly those in the UK for staying on for so long. Um, and the uh, you know 250 people who are still with us, I thank you as well. And of course our interpreters, and I know you're having a particularly hard time uh, with the how quickly I speak, um, uh, lo siento. Uh, so we have a lot of questions and we have uh, uh, the chat and the question and answer have been filled with a, with a lot of um, uh, 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 queries that people want to answer, uh, ask. We've had very good presentations they are talking about the complexities and the challenges that Cuba faces, particularly at what they're attempting to do under very challenging conditions. And one of the questions that has propped up very early on was the question of inequality. What will these measures do in, um, in terms of impact it will have on income equality? How will those whose wages haven't been raised, how will they be assisted? What happens to those who don't re receive remittances, right? And we know that Biden perhaps is on the verge of uh, reauthorizing remittances in Cuba as well. Uh, those people may remember that when Cuba legalized the circulation of the US dollar um, in September of, nine, or decriminalized it in 19, September of 1993, it did lead by Cuban standards to an explosion of inequality. So this is a major question. And I know, Emily, you wanted to tackle it, but everyone else is a, a, a on the panels, I encourage to also answer this question. Unmute, yeah. Okay, just to say a few words about it. That I think the question said, what's it doing to the Gini coefficient? And I think it's an interesting question because the Gini coefficient, some people have attempted to do it, but it's actually pretty um, not, not very useful for measuring inequality in Cuba because until now, of course, um, so much of what Cubans consume is not reflected either in the price, the prices are heavily subsidized or they get free things that provide their, their basic needs. Um, and so measuring inequality in Cuba is different from other countries where people meet most of their needs through cash, through a price system which hasn't been the same as what Cuba's has been. It may become more possible to me measure the Gini coefficient after the uh, monetary unification, and um, when prices start to start to pay a bigger role, um, but what is going to happen is clearly, as I said, people working in the informal sector who were the generally the ones who didn't even weren't registered, who would be working casually in the informal sector, are now looking for work. I think they're the the, the hundred thousand people who registered for work who weren't on the register before who are not working um, and not looking for work. Um, and so those people are clearly feeling that with the prices rising and their incomes not necessarily rising from the private sector or from whatever activities they're doing, and with the wages rising in the state sector, it's now worthwhile to get a job in the state sector. Now that's, that's a positive thing, people moving into the formal sector, they get labor protections, they get um, you know, career progression, they get all the things you get from having a proper job. Um, and also, it's also a reversal of the previous system where people who had state jobs um, were paid, their money was worth so much less than people who were earning money 
informally or in black markets or from remittances. So there's a big reversal going on there. It, you know, in, in the long term, it's a good thing. In the short term, it's very upsetting because a lot of people will have left skilled jobs to be taxi drivers, for example, and the taxi drivers will no longer be as privileged a social group as they have been. And so you're going to have a, a lot of movement. And that's difficult. That's very, very difficult. Um, but in general, the, the, the shift should be in favour of state sector workers and, um, and in favour of more formal employment. Yeah. And uh, sort of to answer some people, there were some questions. What is the Gini coefficient? The Gini coefficient, and Helen's put it in, is a statistical measure of um, the uh, inequality within a society. Uh, zero represents perfect equality. Uh, the higher the Gini coefficient, the more unequal a society is. Um, just as GDP, GDP and GDP per capita are complex things to measure and are not always com uh, give you a complete, uh, shall we say, picture of a country, particularly a country such as Cuba, which is so different from other countries. Uh, the Gini coefficient, while useful, also have to, has to be, um, shall we, uh, taken with certain uh, caveats as well and, uh, and so on. Uh, we also had questions around, and this is uh, obviously, and um, Emily, uh, I don't know if anybody else wants to get into this before we move on. Anybody else wants to talk about in, um, the impact it might have on inequality in Cuba? Uh, and of course, as Emily has pointed out, a uh, shift to where people uh, will find it more productive to be in the state sector, right, is really going to change that so-called inverted pyramid within Cuba. Anybody else on the panelists would like to weigh in on the inequality question? I see no one. Helen? Well, I can. Uh, <laughs> yeah. um, I mean, I just think it's really important, like Emily um, is indicating, that we have to understand the, you know, the role of the state in protecting production and distribution in Cuba. So, um, I mean, I've seen questions like there's been questions in the chat about, you know, uh, how is housing, food and so on distributed? I mean, in the case of housing, 96% of Cubans own their own home. And that is so important when we talk about monetary salaries, because I don't know what your experience is, but you know, in, in our countries, our, a, a huge proportion of our monetary salaries disappears before it's even come, you know, before, before we've seen any of it, because it goes to pay rent. And, um, you know, it's really important to be clear about that. So, uh, also, the Cubans have something called a ration book, which is basically a basic basket of goods, which is guaranteed to all Cuban citizens. Citizens they pay a nominal um, a sum for it, and um, that is, you know, that's afford affordable even to the poorest Cubans. But also, the question of the democratization of opportunity and access to education. You know, what are when. I teach on Latin American history and people are always saying, oh, the problem with uh, Latin American development is there's not enough investment in education. Inve you know, it, it, it's seen as a mechanism to get a higher income, right, to raise wealth in a very individual uh, way. But the Cubans have fr free universal access to education at, at, you know, at all levels. And it's very hard to give that a monetary value because it's social value in terms of allowing everyone the opportunity to excel um, and to you know to diversify their interests and so on is is really important so yes there will be more inequality as more measures are taken in terms of openings to market mechanisms that's clear but what we're mainly talking about is inequality in terms of consumption and inequality in terms of uh, additional bonus or luxury goods. Uh, and I'm not saying that, you know, the Cubans who are uh, quite understandably complaining about, you know, scarcity and so on, I'm not talking about that. But what I'm saying is that um, it won't translate into the kind of structural inequalities that we see in our societies, yeah. where in Britain, the what fifth richest country in the world, we have one in three children um, living under the poverty line. In a country with abundant wealth, we have children going hungry. And we had before the pandemic, one million people who were depending on food banks 
for for survival and and that's the kind of inequality real structural inequality which at the, at this point with the system with the apparatus they have we won't see in cuba yeah thank you for that helen it kind of reminds me where people often yes. say being poor in Cuba uh, is very different than being poor somewhere else, right? You have access to healthcare, access to education, and all, all of these different things. Uh, uh, I think I one yes, Isaac. I, oh. Alejandro. Oh, just want to add something. Uh, there are many coefficients for the measurements of the economy, uh, many indicators that in the case of uh, Cuba in particular, um, sometimes, uh, do not describe the reality at all, don't describe the big picture. And in this case, the uh, Gini coefficients is one of those. Uh, for example, you may think that um, one person that had access to the dollar uh, by the way of remittances, for example, uh, have advantages uh, from uh, uh, other, other, other peoples that don't have this, uh, this, this way to acquire the dollars. But in this ca particular case, the state has a, 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 um, an important role because uh, uh, through the uh, um, social funds, uh, trying to maintain some balance in the, uh, trying to maintain the consumption levels and some balance in the, in the incomes of the people. For example, uh, as many of the panelists uh, just said right now, uh, right now in the short terms is, is you're right, uh, some inequalities could arise, uh, meaning that the, these measures uh, obviously have uh, a, an important shock in the economy in general. Uh, but in the long term, in medium and long term, this will balance the economy and the social funds can, uh, may gain in the long term, obviously, uh, a huge, uh, a, a greater uh, a space in the, in the society, mostly for those people uh, in need. Uh, in this case, uh, nowadays, for example, uh, there are some jobs in the state sector that have uh, an, a greater income uh, than others in the private sector just because uh, the state uh, rise uh, very highly the, the wages and uh, for the consumption could be balanced in this level and obviously uh, try to diminish these inequalities. Uh, by the by other side, uh, we have the access to the uh, educations. Obviously, the, 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 the massive uh, system of education in Cuba offers an opportunity, a great opportunity for every level of the society. You have uh, needs or you don't have any uh, economical needs, uh, have the opportunity to uh, increase your, uh, your skills and obviously uh, take access to uh, higher, uh, uh, higher jobs with higher levels of wages. And in that case, uh, the educations Along, alongside with uh, these social funds from the state, obviously in the long and medium term, we'll have uh, a, a very a greater uh, space in the, in the society and the Cuban economy. Thank you, Alejandro. And I think Juan Miguel would like to add something as well. Yes, uh, thank you so much. Uh, and let me just maybe to add some additional ideas very briefly. Uh, I mean, it is it is obvious that uh, in the in the future there will be made some uh, more precise uh, estimates about the, the the impact of inequalities through different uh, indicators such as uh, Gini and and some others. Uh, and of course, we will have to wait for the result of those data. But the, uh, what we can say for now is that the expectations for the impacts of these measures on on the on inequality, for example, which is uh, one of the questions that uh, have been raised is that uh, the, the measure will impact posi positively in terms of reducing inequalities in the medium and, and, the, long, uh, ter and the long term. And this is uh, due to, to different, for, for different reasons. One is, as has been mentioned uh, by, by some of our panelists before, 
is that there has been already an increase in the number of people uh, demanding for entering into the job market uh, because uh, um, that that has been seen. There has been almost 100,000 people in just in the last two months that have ha have applied for jobs uh, uh, wanting to earn uh, uh, according to the new wage that have been multiplied by five uh, as, an, as an average uh, in, in terms of, of the numbers. And all of that uh, will uh, for sure impact in terms of, of incomes for families, income for, for people all across our, our country. Uh, there, there, there has been also uh, expected uh, an impact in terms of productivity, which is also uh, impactful in a, in a positive way at, uh, across the, the, say the, the economic tissue in, in, in Cuba. There is also an expectation in terms of, of the, uh, the raising of the level of, of the wage and pensions that has been uh, indicated uh, according to the, to the new measures. And, and there, 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 there has been a, so, so far a control of the increase of, of the prices uh, in terms of the inflation in, in the country. So the, the expectation is that uh, the increase of wage and pensions will be uh, uh, much more than the expected increase in, in, in the prices uh, across the economy. And therefore, the impact in terms of uh, in, uh, an improvement in the well-being of the, the population across uh, the country is expected to be uh, much better than what it was before of the new uh, monetary uh, measures uh, in this regard. So uh, just to add uh, these uh, additional ideas, and maybe uh, to respond also some of the questions in the chat that are, are asking uh, about what the, why the focus for, uh, specifically on, on the self-employment and not, for example, regarding some other measures with regard with cooperative uh, in Cuba. And just to say that, uh, I mean, this is not the, the case. I mean, the focus today is because there has been very recently some new measures announced with regard to the self-employment measures and also with the, the elements regarding with the, the, the monetary uh, measures in, in the economy. But there has been a, a, a policy that has been applied in the last years in Cuba and is uh, very, very much uh, being in, uh, still in, implemented that also brings on board the cooperative as a major uh, contribution to the economic and social uh, um, growth in, in, in Cuba in, in, in different regions. And, and that, uh, uh, that policy uh, uh, brings, I mean, is built precisely on the spirit of what a socialist cooperative can be in a country uh, like Cuba. So it is not, let's say, like a divorce between the, the, the private sector and cooperative. It is bringing together all these uh, actors to the economy in order to contribute together with the, 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 the state uh, enterprises and, 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 and the others to the growth and the, and the prosperity and the well-being of, of the Cubans uh, in general. Thank you. Thank you, Juan Miguel. I know Tammy has a point to make, but before she does it, I want to uh, point out that you've made a very important point. We've been focusing on monetary unification and the, the significant expansion of self-employment simply because that's what happened just recently. But there's a whole uh, movement to, uh, to expand cooperatives in Cuba uh, that a lot of people have not been discussing and in fact has become a significant portion of the Cuban economy. And an important point, another important point as well, is the commanding heights, the strategic areas of the Cuban economy are going to remain in the hands of the state. And I think uh, they expand. And in fact, when one looks at the figures of the size of the contribution of self-employment to the Cuban GDP, I mean, the overwhelming uh, wealth that's produced in Cuban resources are still going to come um, from those strategic sections controlled by the state. Uh, Tammy, you, ha uh, you have the floor. 
Yeah, just briefly, because I want to make sure something didn't get lost. When we frame these questions about inequality, um, those of us who come from capitalist systems, we have to make sure we understand that it doesn't work the same in a socialist system and that there's not just single one single actor who can respond to the identification of, of, of a problem in the system, right? So in terms of, Isaac mentioned the cooperatives, if we were to look at non-agricultural cooperatives that are developing now, there are definitely programs and Cuba has a whole system response when it identifies that there's some sort of contradiction in the system. So they maybe have identified that there's an issue with gender and entrepreneurship in, and so then you have a team of experts work with community leaders and women and, and the mass organizations that represent women to develop these type of cooperative relations in response to the, the problem for the targeted group. Right. So just just a reminder that we have to sometimes check the capitalist point of view a little bit to say, OK, um, how does inequality actually impact people in Cuba? They don't lose their houses. They don't lose their health care. They don't lose their access to education. So what exactly does inequality mean in Cuba for Cubans from their perspective is really important to, to remember. And I think that's an excellent point, um, uh, Dr. Lee, simply because even in the case of pandemic, even in Canada and particularly in the United States, people are facing all sorts of evictions and being thrown out in the streets. How inequality and how economic crises are resolved in a context of Cuba is very different than how it takes place in a capitalist society. Uh, Aza, there's a question I think you have. There's so many questions. And it's I know. Such <laughs> And, and th thank you uh, for everybody that answered the previous question. And, and Tammy, I think it was uh, good to add that perspective and framework that you, you mentioned. And uh, our next question um, is if the speakers can talk a little bit more about how people can financially uh, help families and friends in Cuba, especially within the blockades and, and all the things that right now I know Western unions in Canada, we can't send money back to Cuba. Uh, so folks are asking about ways that they can help families and friends in Cuba. And I'm looking at Alejandro or Juan for this or any of the other speakers, if you'd like to jump in. I think Alejandro, if you're trying to speak, I think you are on mute. I, I I, I'm trying to, to say that I don't um, listen very well the, the, oh, the questions. I can, I can, can you repeat it? Yes, of course. Uh, the question was, uh, if you can talk about how people can financially help their families and friends in Cuba. Is that, have you heard the question? Is that? Mm -hmm. How, so you say, um, how can uh, some family, friends, family and friends and the... The question is asked from people that live in the United States or Canada and with the blockade that is, for example, for, with Western Union, people in Canada can't send money back to Cuba or to their friends or family. So the question is, if there is ways that people that are living in the United States or Canada can help support their friends or family back in Cuba. Yes. Well... <clears throat> I think that the the, the main uh, way to to help uh, to their families in Cuba, of course, uh, can be the remittances. But in this particular case, uh, they are still in in place. Uh, many measures of the Trump administration that obviously uh, restrict and limit a lot these uh, remittances to Cuba. In this case, well. Uh, just uh, the the Biden administration now, uh, of course, will have to take some measures in this in this case. Uh, the other way, I think, uh, well, uh, with the travels to Cuba, maybe uh, travels to Cuba with the, the the conditions allowed, of course, because right now with the pandemic, uh, the, the the tourism. Um, and the travels in uh, general pictures is uh, a, a, a little less restricted right now. But I think it's those two, uh, travels and, uh, and remittances. 
uh, both right now and are uh, a little limited by the a little are uh, mostly a lot <laughs> a lot limited by the regulations of the Department of Treasury. Uh, so that uh, leads us to uh, to the Biden administrations. Uh, they talk many times in the in their campaign. Uh, about uh, open the remittances and the travels to Cuba. Uh, but right now, there's any other news about that. Uh, in fact, any higher official of the Biden administration uh, just said that um, they are just uh, uh, looking at the, uh, the Trump policy to Cuba. So we have to wait in this case, mostly because uh, uh, travels and remittances could have uh, an important role, not only for the Cuban families, but uh, in the macroeconomy uh, as well, uh, from the private sector and the state sector of companies, of course, uh, because it's, it, this means uh, a more economical activities uh, to boost precisely uh, the the. The, the macro economy. So I think that these uh, are two ways, uh, remittances and troubles, but uh, we have to wait. We have to wait for the Biden administration to say something about this, to take some measures to open the remittances and travel for a, 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 free, a, a free development of these sectors. And I think it's, it's all for now. Thank you, Alejandro. And I see uh, Juan Miguel, your hand is up. So please go ahead. Yes, uh, thank you so much. And, and maybe just to add uh, something to, to, to the response. I believe that we should try to focus the answer to the question in a more, let's say, a strategic manner or with a more long, in the long run view. Uh, I believe that more than being focusing on how to, let's say, in the short term, we I mean, people here in, or in any other part of the world could directly help their relatives and their families in Cuba. I believe that the most important is to have in mind that, uh, for example, activities like this and all the, the substantive actions that uh, organizations like yours uh, do across the United States, uh, across the networks, across social media, uh, contribute in the long run to what is more important, which is to end uh, the, the blockade against Cuba, which is in, uh, actually the main reason uh, why the, the Cuban economy uh, is uh, having to go through such uh, hard uh, difficulties and, 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 and times. So uh, fighting in order to eliminate the, the, the blockade in all the possible ways, uh, is the, the, the main contribution that I believe that we can do in order to guarantee a, a better future for our families in Cuba and all the Cubans uh, uh, across, uh, across the world. Thank you. Yeah. We also have a question here, and it's probably it's not related. To, it's come up a couple of times. It's not directly related to the economy, uh, but uh, Dr. Morris sort of alluded to its indirect connection to the economy, which are the vaccines, right? As we know, uh, the people who are asking when, how can, how can they get the vaccines? What impact will the uh, Soberana dose? And there's also another one in mass production. Once Cuba is vaccinated, what kind of impact will it have on Cuba, it's, on Cuba itself? And of course, Cuba is planning to produce 100 million doses and perhaps even more uh, later on when other vaccines come online to actually be dis distributed throughout the global south. So I don't know if either Dr. Morris and uh, Dr. Yaffe and maybe uh, the others on the panel would want to um, perhaps uh, 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 have a, a response to that question and a comment. Um, I'll say something there because obviously I've been doing a bit of research, you know, the history of Cuban medical science. And it's really interesting that the mainstream media seems to have suddenly twigged on that there's a story here in relation to Cuba because Cuba has four domestic vaccines under production, the only country in Latin America, and um, will be moving to phase three trials for Soberano 2, which is one of those four, on Monday. 
Um, and, you know, actually all of this makes sense if you know about Cuba's, the, the history of its um, biotechnology sector, medical science, and in general, Cuba's quite exemplary response internationally and nationally to COVID-19. If you look at their history of medical internationalism, uh, disease control, epidemiology, which is a word I hate saying because I'm not very good at it. Um, uh, you know, the fact that after eliminating the main infectious diseases that the, you know, were is still in Cuba when the revolutionary state took over, they then sent tens of thousands, it ended up being hundreds of thousands, 400,000 medical professionals have gone from Cuba around the world. And loads of those went to countries in the global south, for example, in, in Africa, which had infectious diseases which had long since been eliminated in Cuba. So they had a standard procedure that the medics would return from those countries and enter into quarantine. Um, you know, and, and their, their response has been entirely consistent with that. They have adapted and produced a whole portfolio of medicines to treat COVID-19 patients. And, and now they have these four vaccines. So, I mean, isn't it this cred incredible dichotomy? Isn't this, this is um, really disgusting situation that Cuba's in, that it has the capacity, a small island nation blockaded for 60 years in the Caribbean, it has the capacity to be among the well leading, um, you know, medical scientists in producing a vaccine within a year or something for this uh, pandemic. But at the same time, they are struggling because of the United States blockade to get the syringes that are needed for mass vaccination. And that was why the, the campaign that I talked about was precisely to raise money to help to buy syringes and that campaign has been blocked. So, um, you know, I just think that we, we've really all got a moral ob obligation. I've been saying to various journalists, even today, um, you know, how trustworthy is this Cuban medicine they're asking? I'm saying, look, outside of Cuba, uh, you know, in, the, in Europe and the US, right, uh, people are alarmed, but actually the global South knows about Cuba's biotech sector. They know about Cuban medical science and they know about Cuba's um, incredible achievements in public health because Cuba before the pandemic was already exporting to 49 countries. It already had joint ventures in um, nine and it was increasing to 10 countries. Cuba's interferon alpha 2b was produced in, by Cubans. The Cubans produced it in 1986. And then it was produced in China through a joint venture for, since, uh, since 2003. So these are platforms, what the, what the Cubans are working with, like all the big pharma are doing, they're it, taking existing platforms for vaccine development and they are working with them. Now, the Cuban approach is subunit vaccines, is very complex, but they're you, working with proteins. is very, it it's, comes on a, a history of proving to be very safe and with high efficacy. So, you know, I would say to anyone who is considering, because this has been a question in the chat, you know, should I go to Cuba to get a vaccine? Just, you know, you'll be in very safe hands if you do. The vaccine that Cuba's talking about, the Soberano 2, is um, they're going to give it in two week doses, um, which means that within one month, basically, you could have all, all three doses. They're now saying three doses. Um, it doesn't need to be stored at exceptionally frozen temperatures. It's going to be stored at between two and eight degrees, which is the norm for vaccines. And just remember that, you know, uh, Cuban children are vaccinated for 13 diseases with 11 vaccinations and eight of those Cuba produces on its own. It is an incredible record. Suddenly, you know, we're all soul searching. In Britain, we're saying, why don't we have the capacity to produce any of the drugs that we consume? Cuba has been forced, because the US blockade includes medicine and medical equipment, to innovate and to really prioritise this sector. And they produce nearly 70% of the medicines consumed domestically. The problem is, that even to produce domestic medicines, they require uh, raw materials that have to be imported. And so the, the US blockade is now impacting on their capacity to provide medicines that, that have long 
since being part of the staple in Cuba? I uh, thank you for that very detailed answer, Helen. And I think, you know, another point that's really critically important is Cuba is also challenging with its biotech, its biopharmaceutical industry, this notion that the global south is incapable of knowledge generation, right? That all scientific knowledge, all know-how, all innovation in a positive sense only resides in the West. And somehow the benighted darker countries of the world are incapable of intellectual um, uh, in, uh, in, in, uh, contributions to the world. So Cuba has really challenged that. Now, we've been going on this one for quite a while. Uh, I, there's lots of more questions than we can actually answer. Uh, I, I, I would let people to know, uh, tell people a couple of things. One, some of your questions have actually been answered in the chat as you've posted them. The other point is that this webinar will also be available for people to watch at their leisure once the link is available. So I think that's important as well to bear in mind. And unfortunately, all good things must come to a close, right? I really feel for my colleagues in the United Kingdom who have demonstrated a tenacity, a stamina, and a resilience of staying up so late. But this has been an incredibly rich discussion. And we're going to close, perhaps, by asking each of the panelists to sort of reflect on this question. In a sense, with Cuba dealing with this complex economic issues and an incredibly challenging time, what lessons do you think Cuba has for the world, especially in a time of global crisis? Who would like to go first? Perhaps maybe, we can start. With we Dr. could Morris. go to the opposite order of how we started, if that's okay. Dr. Morris. <laughs> uh, Dr. Emily Morris, the floor is yours. Okay. Um, yeah. Well, in so many different ways. I think, you know, in terms of dealing with that, that you know, there are real shortages now. Things are very difficult. I think what they could teach is the complete commitment of the government to protecting the most vulnerable. That's the starting point, that's the bottom line, that's, the, that's um, where, where they're beginning from. And you know, when you do that, then everything else follows. And I think that their, their capacity to do that comes from real commitment. So it's all the way through, you know, it's right to the local level and social workers know the people who are most vulnerable. And I think that that's kind of interesting because that's what has been rather absent in our own responses to um, COVID and to economic downturns in general. Dr. Lee? Yeah, I would say that, of course, revolution is a process that's always moving and not a simple point in time. And so one of the things that's important to the revolutionary process that Cuba will always be um, a great model for is the, is the relationship between the state and its citizens. And the fact that you have to have a government that's embedded with the citizen and is tied to the well-being of its citizens. And I think that that's the, that's the lesson when it's really hard times that Cuba time and time again, right, comes out of the storm because they know how to talk and love one another. And this is something that, you know, we don't have the benefit of in other nations right now. Um, we are in the United States, so divided institutionally and individually. And I think that, you know, if we had a stronger and closer relationship with the people who are governing us, it might be a, a recipe for survival. Dr. Yaffe? Well, I think after decades of being told that only the free market leads to efficient outcomes, the whole response globally to COVID-19 um, really puts into question the, the very concept of efficiency. And Cuba shows that you cannot have the profit motive in healthcare if you want to have um, efficient outcomes from the perspective of human welfare and, and health. So I think it's this really important point. Emily um, articulates it as the state cares. Uh, Tammy says, you know, the communication between the state and the people, but it's absolutely, it's having a planned economy, which has as its objective to, you know, the development of social development and, and human welfare. And, and that's absolutely it. And they could have years ago opened up their biotech sector to private interests, but they never did because they clear, they understand the, um, 
the really detrimental impact that that has when you start to take things like healthcare and run them in the interests of private profit, not social good. The, uh, our last two uh, commenters will be our Cubans, our guests, and of course I know how humble uh, Cubans are, the humility uh, is part and parcel of this character that's been, uh, that has been cultivated in the Cuban revolution, but Alejandro Martinez, Gonzalez, you have the floor. Yes, I think that the best quality right now to share with the rest of the world, uh, it will be the social vocation of the revolution. Uh, I think that the world needs to focus more in social, in, in policies with uh, social directions than in economic ones. Uh, not always the economic growth means an increase in the social, uh, in the social uh, expectations of living and, 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 and and resources for the for the social uh, for the people. Uh, I think that yes, the best quality of the revolution to share with the rest of the world will be uh, social the social uh, vocation of the revolution. In this world, I think that the financial sector has gained uh, an enormous uh, role in the rest of the economy, and no, and this power in the economy by the financial sector leads to a political uh, influence that uh, diminish the, the social vacancy of, the, of many governments. So I think that we need to focus a little more in the, in the social needs than in the, 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 the economy per se. Juan Miguel Gonzalez. Yes, uh, thank you so much. I, I believe that the, the, the best qualities or lessons that can be learned, I, I, I First, I join and I support all that has been said before, but I also believe that they can be uh, taken from two different uh, uh, directions, uh, which complement uh, each other. One is in, in, in the international arena. I believe that uh, the Cuban revolution in, in this uh, last year, um, including and in particular in the last one in the middle of the COVID pandemic, has been that uh, in order to the world safe itself, the only way to do so uh, would be through international cooperation and solidarity. Because uh, uh, otherwise, mm, what it is called, for example, uh, vaccine nationalism, uh, one country trying to save itself uh, in detriment of, of the others will only serve uh, for all the, the rest of the world to never be able to, to cope and to deal with uh, this particular pandemic, but also with all many other important uh, problems that uh, are, are relevant for today's world. So solidarity and, and cooperation, I believe that would be a, a war for, for today. And uh, in the, uh, as, in, as a model for the world, I believe that another important lesson that uh, we can see from Cuba is that there is a, 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 a it is very important a system that puts uh, people at its center, uh, and a system that uh, rather than seeking profits from uh, selling medicine goods, is trying in, uh, in, the, in the first place to seek the welfare of, of, its, own, of its own people. And in this case, uh, we have tried to do so uh, among many other uh, issues. Uh, through, for example, a free educational system, a free health system that in this current context is fundamental in order to guarantee and ensure the free and universal access of all Cubans to the, the best science and the best health that they can reach uh, in, in Cuba. And as many other panelists have, uh, have already pointed out, many of the vaccines, uh, many of the medicines that uh, Cubans will get are, are produced in Cuba despite the blockade but because we have had the almost 60 years, uh, a system that has tried to develop uh, and put a, a Cuban science uh, at the center as well. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you to all our panelists who gave such brilliant, insightful and powerful presentations. 
Thank you to those uh, participants who listened and the attendees. We have over 300 and I know it's been a long, a long um, webinar. Thank you, especially to the interpreters, especially those who were able perhaps to interpret past portions of my remarks. Uh, a great thanks to all of you. Thank you to my co-chair, Aza uh, Rosby, who is the, um, obviously, she's, um, uh, shall we say, a stalwart in these webinars. And also, I encourage people as well, not only, and the other people behind the scenes, Erin uh, uh, Freely and Nahum and others who participate in organizing this webinar. I also encourage people to go to the US Cuba Normalization website. There's a lot of activities that are taking place. Uh, there's a Savings Lives campaign that was mentioned. Uh, 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 over 15, uh, at least 15, uh, U.S. states and labor councils have passed resolutions calling for medical collaboration and cooperation with Cuba in the face of this pandemic. But we also have a growing movement to end the blockade against Cuba uh, so that Cuba you know, can develop without having to deal with this kind of external aggression. Uh, I think this has been a brilliant webinar, very insightful, and we look forward to meeting you not only in intellectual spheres, but also in the crucible of struggle. Thank you to my lovely co-chair Isaac. Thank you. Uh, it's been uh, wonderful to have all of you here today. And I know uh, for Dr. Helen and, and Dr. Emily, you're staying up. Uh, thank you for staying with here with us. And for folks actually in Eastern the United States of Canada, you're staying up. It's, it's kind of my dinner time here in Vancouver West Coast. It's about 7 p.m. So it's perfect timing for me, but thank you all for being here. And um, to echo what Isaac said, uh, this webinar has been extremely important in the context of the important work um, of the alliance between Cuba and, and, and Canada and the United States and the work of the US Cuba normalization. Um, so I want to remind you all and invite you to visit the website. Um, it will be also posted in the chat, but it is us.cubanormalization.org. So please pay attention to the website. There's a lot of information that's being posted there about different resolutions, as Isaac said, that are being passed across the United States but also upcoming webinars and upcoming events. And um, I'd like to invite uh, all our panelists to turn on your cameras and, and say hello to everybody that joined us here today. A big thanks to the translators. Your patience is immense. Thank you so much. And Isaac said, I have the tendency similar to him of speaking a little bit fast. So thank you for your patience with all of us and thank you all for joining us. Have a good night. And Viva Cuba. Viva Cuba. Thank you all. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Thank you all for participating. Thank you all. Cuba si bloqueo no. Cuba si bloqueo no. Viva Cuba. Viva Cuba. Thank you all. Thank you all. And viva Cuba y la revolución. Viva. Viva. Thank you.